Dr. Jabor said, I'm Dr. Irving. I am a PA, I work out at the Coast Guard base. A uh, little background on me, just so you know who I am and why I'm here. Uh, after I would, graduated from Azusa Pacific University, biology, bachelor's, joined the Army 2002, just shortly after 9-11. Uh, so um, some of you probably weren't very old when that happened, or even alive, maybe. No. Um, so joined the Army, was in the Army for 12 years, enlisted as a combat medic, went to Iraq twice. Went to PA school in the Army, inter-service physician assistant program uh, through the University of Nebraska. Got my master's in PA studies and went to Afghanistan with the Army and then got tired of deploying with the Army. So I switched to the Coast Guard about three, four years ago now. So here I am. Um, so anyway, please feel free to stop me if you guys have questions. we got a lot to cover. We'll get us through as much as we can today. And then uh, if we need to, we'll keep, keep going on lab on Thursday. Okay, so... Uh, Dr. Jabor and I are kind of adjusting the lab to make sure we got plenty of time to, to cover everything. Okay, so this is a lot. Uh, tissues isn't always the most fun thing, but it's all building blocks, right? So you guys just did your genetic stuff and any chemistry in that or not much? Okay, uh, so people disparage chemistry a lot, but actually there's kind of a lot to it. How many nurses want to be nurses do I have in here? One, two, three, four. Okay, a few maybe. BAs? Anybody want to be like that? All right, cool. Couple maybe. Uh, what else we got? Doctors. All right. Uh, hydrologist, but maybe something nursing or whatever. Anything else? What else we got? Oh, nursing. General. General studies. Just because anatomy is an awesome general class to take. Yeah. All right. I'm down with that. Okay. Cool. So I asked that because I want to like try to kind of tailor it to what you might be interested in. So uh, I come at come at it from a clinical background, um, but you know, we'll try to talk about it through the eyes of a nurse, a PA, and some of that stuff so that it makes it applicable and it's not like, oh, uh, I don't really care what particular cell types line each individual organ and that sort of thing. So, all right. So like Dr. Jabor said, histology is a study of tissues. And so we're going to go through a lot of these today, all these different types. We're going to talk about junctions and development and everything like that. And then the next thing we're going to talk about is the skin, which is pretty awesome. And so, but hopefully we'll have time to get to that tonight. So your whole body only has about 200 different cell types. And there's four primary tissue types, okay? Uh, so when I look at histology, this is like the microscopic level. So lab on Thursday, we'll be doing some microscope work, not a ton, but just enough to give you guys kind of an idea of some of that stuff. And then the tissues build together, like so we have cells that join together to form tissues that join together to form organs, right? So I'm going to give you some... I like interaction, so I'm going to be asking questions, and so I'm going to start out with some easy ones. So just name some organs. We can throw out some of those. The liver, right? What else? Lungs. The lungs. The stomach. What else? Gallbladder. Gall what else? Pancreas. That's an exciting one. Brain. The brain. That's a big one, right? What's the biggest organ in our body? Skin. The skin, right? That's like I said. We're going to talk about that today. Good. Okay. So we're 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 firing on all cylinders, right? You guys had your test. You can. Don't dump that stuff, but, you know, we're, we're moving on. All right, so a tissue is a group of similar cells that and cell products that arose from the same region of the embryo. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And the main difference between primary tissue classes is the types and the functions of the cells. And then there's also the characteristics of the matrix. So the matrix is what's outside the cells. And so that's when we say extracellular material, that means what's outside the cells. So there's the fibrous proteins. We'll get into some of those kinds and the ground substance. And that's like this kind of clear, jelly, gooey stuff. And there's different levels of that. Different types of tissues have more and less ground substance. We'll talk about all that stuff. And then uh, the amount of space that's occupied by a cell versus the matrix. We'll get into that too. All right. So an embryo begins as a single cell, right? So as soon as you have sperm meets egg, you have everything you need for the building blocks of a complete human being. So even though it's a tiny little cell, it is now complete. And through all those wonderful processes that you just learned about, mitosis and all that stuff, we eventually get to where you're sitting today, right? So it's pretty awesome how that all works out. Um, and so as this goes, so the first few weeks, it really, it really happens fast too. So a lot of this stuff is happening really quickly. You get a lot of cell division early on, and this thing forms, you get the single cell that forms like a blastocyst and kind of goes through all these different changes, and then it starts to fold. And the different layers as it folds, it all start from the single cell, those different layers then differentiate into different tissues and different organs. Okay, so it's it's remarkable. If you ever have time to study embryology, uh, it's just amazing. So, 
when we look at the preparation of histological specimens, oh, that's a big word, right? Uh, so that just means, like, what are we looking at for slides? When we do that, we have to preserve them in a fixative, something that's going to prevent them from decaying. And then we have to slice them into really super thin sections, because otherwise the light from the microscope is not going to penetrate far enough through for us to be able to see them. So they're mounted on slides and they're colored with a stain. And that's to, you know, stick to different components in there. So usually like the nucleus is going to be purple and then the, the cell body and all the other stuff, you'll kind of see it as a pinky color. Um, and then when you section an organ, it no longer has that three-dimensional shape. So when we look at a heart, right, it's about this size-ish, and but it's a three-dimensional organ. As soon as we slice that up, it loses its three-dimensional structure. So as we look at these things, try to picture them in their 3D component. It's hard, but uh, so like if we take it with an egg, the more you slice the egg, you're going to look at different parts. So sections one and five, you wouldn't even see the yolk. Right, but then sections two, three, and four, you're going to see different levels of how big the yolk is comparatively. So you put all those together and you have a complete egg. So when you're looking at a slide, you're only looking at one tiny little thin, skinny slice that's super, super thin. It's the same thing when we look at, so clinically speaking, we look at MRIs or CT scans. So anybody familiar with those? Kind of maybe sort of. So an MRI uses the magnetic fields that's generated in your body by all your cells. And that takes, uh, it basically takes a whole lot of slices through the body. So you guys just learned about all your sagittal and your cross sections and all that kind of stuff, right? So an MRI will take, using that magnetic field, will then take different images through that. And it's going to take, depending on what size of a scanner you have, so there's like the 16 slice and the 32 slice. So how many pictures you're going to get through each individual body region that you're, su you're studying. And so it'll do like, you know, uh, it'll do sagittal planes, it'll do... Uh, cross sections, it'll do all those kind of things. And so then the, the radiologist then has to put that together and look at it, imagine it as a one big organ. So he or she is, is scrolling through and seeing slice after slice after slice, and then they have to picture that as one you know, whole organ. So when they're talking about tumors and things like that, then they have to imagine it as a whole unit rather than just the individual slice. Dragon? All right. <clears throat> Same thing when we look at uh, different types of tubules and everything like that. When we slice it, if you got your macaroni noodle here, it may not even look like it, you know, it's connected at all. It looks like two individual tubes, but as you slice it differently, you see, oh, there's a connection, and then here it doesn't even look hollow. Same kind of thing when we have when we're looking at our slices, okay? So this is sort of an example from uh, you know a gland or a tubule in your body. So if you were to slice it this way, sometimes you can get a pretty good idea of what it looks like all the way down. But if you slice it this way, then you're only going to see the tube like that, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, and then here's an example of that. So you got your bones, you got your longitudinal sections where you cross, you know, cut them that way, cross sections going that way, and oblique, we kind of cut in a diagonal. Uh, and all those things, you know, just depending on what you're looking at, it's going to show you different things. The obliques are tough. Uh, they can be valuable, but they're also difficult because they change. You're not seeing the cells in like a straight line shape. You're seeing the cells at an angle at times. So, and just again, you have to kind of picture what this organ is. So when you look at the slide, it's going to tell you what it is. And you have to picture, okay, if I'm looking at a section of a liver, what does the liver look like in space, generally speaking? And then how does this little tiny piece of it fit into that bigger chunk? All right. Questions on that stuff so far? I'm just breezing through that stuff really quick. All right, good. So epithelial tissue. This is the lining of pretty much anything, all right? So one or more layers of closely adhering cells. So they're all really tightly stuck together. Uh, they form a flat sheet for an upper, with the upper surface exposed to an environment or a body cavity. So when we say environment or body cavity, what do you think we mean? What's like the environment? The outside, right? Everything outside of us. And a body cavity, what would be an example of a body cavity? The abdominal, well, cavity, okay, what else? But what kind of organ? So, like, we have different types of organs, right? So, with the liver, is that a solid or a hollow organ? Solid. Solid, right? So, what would be a hollow organ? The lungs, somewhat. The stomach, very good. Anything, the intestines, right? That whole long, curvy thing there, that's all hollow. So, epithelial tissue lines those type of organs, all right? So, you're going to have, even if it's not exposed to the direct air, uh, it's exposed to, you know, it opens up to an, exposed to an opening. <clears throat> Uh, there's no room for blood vessels, all right, so nothing in between here. And so it needs the connective tissue that lies underneath it 
to get all of its nutrients, its oxygen, everything else. It sits on what's called a basement membrane. So the, the tissue itself, get that thing out there. <coughs> button right okay so that basement membrane down there you can kind of see that oh, there we go so that down there that's got all the connective tissue in it it still does not have necessarily the blood vessels the blood vessels are probably going to be down here and then they're going to diffuse that diffusion osmosis thing we were just talking about all their nutrients up into the cells okay <clears throat> All right, so there's simple and there's stratified. Those are the two really basic types of epithelium. Simple is simple. It has only one layer. Uh, it's named by the shape of the cells. I think you guys looked at some of those, cuboidal and squamous and all that kind of stuff. So we'll talk about that. You've already got a little bit of a, a kind of a baseline understanding of that. When we look at stratified, it's got more than one level. <clears throat> uh, and then it's, again, named by the shape of the cells that are on the top. All right, so if there's different shapes that are down below, and when we say apical cells, we mean the ones that are on the top or whatever one is affecting either coming in contact with the environment or the body cavity. So simple squamous epithelium, that's these little jobbies here. You see they're one cell thick. And again, this is a cross section, so there's cells here that you just can't see because of the way they section it. But it's one cell thick. And, okay. Single row, they're flat, so squamous, think of squamous as kind of a flat, squished, squamous, squished. That's how I remember it anyway, all right? <clears throat> Allows for rapid diffusion of substances, so why do you think that would be? Because it needs to take things in. So, but why, why do these ones let them diffuse rapidly? So you guys just did diffusion on your test, right? So what's diffusion? Um, Somebody besides awesome. Autumn. You're good. I like you, but... <laughs> but I need some more interaction. Feed me, people. Feed me. All right. Uh, so, yes, passing from one side to the other, okay? Um, so, alveoli, glomeruli, endothelium, and serosa. Those are a lot of big words, right? Anybody know where the alveoli are found? The lungs. Very good. What about glomeruli? Uh, kidneys. All right. Those are in the kidneys. Endothelium, that's yeah, all over the place. Uh, and serosa, yeah. So why, we started to touch on this now, why would, for example, the glomeruli, why would they need to have, uh, so why would simple squamous epithelium be beneficial to be inside the kidneys and the glomeruli? Let me give you a little background. The glomeruli are these little kind of a ball-shaped thing where you have uh, a whole bunch of blood vessels and then you have a tubule from the kidney and the little capillaries come around here and all the blood filters through there and it comes in and then the waste products come out into this little uh, ball capsule thing and then it starts to get filtered through and some of that goes back in and gets reabsorbed and some of it becomes urine. So why would simple squamous be a really beneficial tissue type to have in that sort of a scenario? Because the load they have to go through as a specialized cell they would be able to move quickly? Right, so because anytime we're doing a filtration, anytime we want to move stuff from one side to the other, the less space we have to move it through, the easier it is, right? So if they're squished and flat like this, and there's only one layer of them, then it's super easy to move stuff from one side to the other. Does that make sense? So you'll find that I'm kind of a big why guy, all right? Because if you don't know why, then you don't know what the purpose is. And again, you're just going to be like, I don't care, Dr. Irving, this doesn't matter to me. Um, but so if we can understand a little bit of the why, then we get a little bit better picture of, you know, what's going on in your body and, again, looking at it clinically. So let's look at this from a clinical standpoint then. So if we're thinking about these layers that have only one cell thick, what then could be a, a damage or a detriment? How could that be affected more easily than some places where you have more layers? So maybe not an adequate job, but it did. I mean, our bodies function pretty well most of the time, right? Your kidneys are working right now. I see water bottles out here, right? They're doing their job. They're doing their thing. Uh, but what else? Do you think that we could, if we have, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about it. So if you have a big overload in here, is it going to be able to keep stuff out? So if you're putting too much strain on them, then they have a more difficult time of, of doing their job. Okay, so they're... Uh, if you're forcing more fluids or if you have, well, let's say for an example, if you have what's called uh, hyponatremia, which means that you don't have enough sodium in your body, all right? 
So when you're looking at diffusion, right, water follows salt or osmosis. So your body needs salt for a lot of different things. But one of the purposes is uh, it keeps salt in a particular percentage in your body so that the water will then diffuse across as it's supposed to. So that's why if you don't eat and you only drink water, eventually you're going to come up with uh, problems of like conduction issues and all these other things. And you're going to have potentially kidney shutdown because your kidneys aren't even going to filter anything anymore because you have all this water that's in there or they're going to filter too much and they're just going to be shoving all the water out and you're losing everything. You're not keeping it because there's no salt in your body to, to maintain the water. Okay. And with these little cells, and then if we have like something called diabetes, you know, everybody's heard of that, right? Or as Wilford Brimley on those commercials says diabetes, you know, I don't know who says that, but he does. So then what happens is you've got these big sugar molecules that are stuck in your blood, right? And that's these giant. So here's your chemistry. This chemistry is important and we love chemistry. All right. You got these giant sugar molecules and they're way too big to fit anywhere. And when you run out of insulin, which is made in the pancreas, then you don't have a way to put that sugar inside the cells. So now the sugar's in your blood cells or in your bloodstream, and it's like, I always talk about it like it's the rowdy drunk at the bar, okay? So you got, you know, your, your bloodstream's like kind of the chill bar. Everybody's just hanging out. Nobody's like getting rowdy. Everybody's, you know, we're doing our thing. We're just hanging out with friends. And then all of a sudden, sugar shows up. And sugar's like this rowdy drunk guy, and insulin's like your bouncer. So insulin comes and he takes sugar and he throws them into the cells, all right, or throws them on the street if you want to look at it that way. But when insulin's not around, the bouncer's not there, the rowdy drunk starts to make trouble. And he starts to punch holes in things where he shouldn't be, be punching holes and stuff. So now you get to these one cell layer thick things, you got this giant sugar molecule, and it's like, I go where I want. I'm gonna tell, I'll tell you when I had enough. And so it punches a giant hole in your kidneys here, and there's only one cell layer to stop it. And... It's like, you know, your thin drywall where somebody knocks a hole in the wall really easily. Basically, that's the same thing. So now you got sugar that's pushing its way through in other places, and now sugar's coming out in your urine where it's not supposed to, and your kidneys are getting uh, jacked up because of all this, you know, giant molecule that's pushing through there. So all that to say, everything has a reason for why it's there, but, uh, you know, there's also the potential for, you know, problems at these different areas. So, sorry, tangent there. But. All right. Simple cuboidal. Again, simple, so sing, single row. All right, cube shape, cuboidal, cube, right? To be pretty obvious. Often with microvilli. So what are microvilli? Do you know what that one is? The little things that give it more surface area. Very good, yes. More things, little things that give it surface area. Good. So uh, in your intestines, that's a big absorption area, right? So it's got all these kind of little folds that go in and out. So all that food that's coming into you, when it gets broken down in its little chemical components and gets absorbed into your body, now you have all this extra surface area to do that. So any type of absorption and secretion, you're going to find those things. So that's your liver, your thyroid, salivary, other glands, bronchioles, kidneys, tubules, all that kind of stuff. So, all right, good. Uh, simple columnar, so columnar column, right? <clears throat> Vertically oriented with the nuclei in the basal half of the cell. So that means the nucleus is on the bottom half, so closer to the basement membrane here. <clears throat> again, these do a lot with absorption and secretion. Sometimes they have microvilli. You're going to see, again, microvilli, you're going to find it in the inner lining of the GI tract, so GI, gastrointestinal, that's your intestines, the uterus, kidney, and the uterine tubes. Okay. <clears throat> all right, pseudostratified. So when microscopy first became a thing, they found all these cells that looked like they were stratified, but it wasn't until microscopy got better that they were able to figure out, oh, they're actually not stratified. They're not stacked on top of each other. They do reach all the way to the basement membrane, but they look kind of like they're stacked on top of each other. And some of that's because of what these things called goblet cells are. And so that's going to be like, uh, you know, stuff that produces mucus, things like that. Um, so it looks stratified, but it's not stratified. So it's tricky. But it secretes and propels respiratory mucus. It's found primarily in the respiratory system. So why do you think we would need cells like this in our respiratory system? In our big airways. Good. Okay. I'm glad everybody's thinking. They have the answer in their brain. And they want to spit it out, but they're embarrassed. That's okay. Uh, so cilia. What are cilia? Anybody know what those are? They're not microvilli, they're different. They kind of, they're a lot longer and they can move things. Very good, yes. Yeah. So they're, they're almost like little hairs, okay? And they sort of move things and they make this generally sweeping motion. So 
in your bigger airway passages, they make this sweeping motion. There's always this kind of a current moving through there. So whenever you inhale stuff from the air, they're the things that like sort of try to push it out. Now you got these goblet cells and that's mucus and nobody likes mucus, right? It's gross, but it's also serves an important function because it helps to trap that stuff that you breathe in. That's maybe not the best for you. All right. Whether it's secondhand smoke or firsthand smoke, if you smoke, quit. All right. There, we're done. Um, but you know, any sort of things that we go and we breathe in, be it, uh, you know, smog or whatever else we don't have nearly as much in Kodiak as we do other places, but still there. So mucus traps the stuff and the cilia helps move it out. Now, when you smoke, the tar from the cigarettes gunks these things up and makes it so they don't move anymore. And so that's why you get smokers cough because your cilia aren't doing their job anymore. They're not moving things up. And so now you got to get that crap out any other way you can. And the way you do that is by coughing. So there is your fun fact for the day. All right, stratified. So stratified means more than one layer. <clears throat> and again, they're named for the surface type of cells. The deepest cells sit on the basement membrane, and then they kind of go up from there. So there's lots of variations. There's keratinized and non-keratinized, and we'll, get over, we'll go over some of those today. The keratinized have a layer of dead cells at the top, and the non-keratinized do not. There's a keratinized stratified epithelium, and this is squamous epithelium. So again, squamous being the top level here. So this whole dead squamous cells, uh, you know, they're still squamous, they're flattened, they're squished, but they're not, they don't have nuclei in them anymore, they're not dividing anymore, they're not doing, you know, that primary function. Um, so, but this is your multi-layered epithelium, and we'll get more into the layers of the skin later when we get into the skin lecture. We make it tonight, I don't know, but we'll see. And the main purpose of this is to stop water loss, prevent penetration of organisms. So if you got, you know, bacteria that are sitting out here, and all this stuff prevents it from getting back into here and back into here uh, where it can do some damage, right? So your skin is like your first line of defense against all that kind of stuff. So this forms the epidermal layer of your skin, so all the outside stuff that you see. And then the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So this is multi-layered, so lots of layers, uh, but it's, you know, dead cells forming abrasion-resistant, moist, slippery layer. So these cells up here are still dead, but they're not, uh, they don't have that keratin, that hard stuff like you feel on the outside here. And this is like the inside of your mouth, on your tongue, uh, in your esophagus, and in the, in the vaginal walls. <clears throat> so why do we think, what's the purpose, what's the benefit? We already talked about the keratinized ones, so why in these areas, why is it beneficial to not have the keratinized? Because they need to let the goods through. Sure, that's part of it, right? It's pretty hard to chew if the inside of your mouth is like skin, right? Because then you got all this dry skin on the inside there. So we've got to have, you know, moisture in your mouth to be able to create saliva to help with the digestive processes. So that's a big one. Um, yeah, same thing with swallowing, all that stuff. It's important to have, you know, lubrication so you're not, every time you eat, then you're just ripping skin layers off of your, yeah, the keratinized stuff. All right, <clears throat> stratified cuboidal. Again, two or more layers, stratified, two or more layers. The surface cells are square, cube in shape, and these are the kinds of things that secrete sweat. Uh, ovarian hormones, they produce sperm, and they're found all the same places that we just talked about. So, All right, transitional epithelium. This is one that they used to think, again, beginning stages of microscopy, they thought it was when it was transitioning from one type of epithelium to another. They later realized that, no, it's actually its own sort um, but it looks a little bit different. So it, they were like, ah, oh, it's not really cuboidal. It's not really squamous. It's something kind of in the middle. So transitional, uh, it's more rounded, but they flatten when the tissue stretch. So this is in your bladder, your kidney, your, uh, ureters, things like that. So why is it beneficial to have stretchy things in those places? They fill, they fill up with fluids, right? <clears throat> if you couldn't stretch your bladder out, we'd be, I mean, you'd be taking breaks every five minutes here. Like, I would be. I don't know. All right. Uh, so now, okay, that's the epithelium. I know I'm talking fast, but I'm trying to get through a lot. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, concerns, comments? I'll even allow a snide remark because, you know. Well, I will say your description of diabetes is the best thing I've ever heard. Good. All right. <laughs> the rowdy drunk at the bar, right? Now, maybe you'll never forget that. So, uh, I'm sorry, it's probably not on the test, but. <laughs> But again, now you understand why we need simple stratified, simple stratified epithelium or 
simple squamous epithelium in a glomeruli, and what can go wrong when things get messed up. Good. Other questions, thoughts? If not, we'll move on to connective tissues. So when we talk about connective tissues, these are things that connect stuff, right? That makes sense. Some things in anatomy are just named after dead white dudes, uh, but other things are like actually make sense. So connective tissue is one of those things that actually makes sense, all right? Um, and they're actually trying to go away from the dead white guy naming because, frankly, who knows who Eustatius was that your Eustatian tubes are named after. That doesn't help me. So they're in your ears, by the way. But, you know. Anyway, uh, so <clears throat> connective tissue, widely spaced cells separated by fibers and ground substance. And it's the most variable and abundant tissue type. So it's all over the place. The functions obviously connects organs together gives support and protection, and then it stores, uh, stores energy, heat production, and it moves and transports things. So it's really broad, a lot of different, uh, different functions, and, and just sort of like some of it you won't even necessarily think of. So blood is one type, and you wouldn't necessarily think of that as a connective tissue, but it is because it comes into this movement and transport material side. So the cells of connective tissue, when we look at the individual cells that make up the tissue, we have fibroblasts that produce fibers, so blasts build stuff. So fibroblasts build, they produce fibers and they produce ground substance. The macrophages are white blood cell types that wander through there and they're just kind of hanging out, looking around for uh, stuff to eat, basically. So anything that they're, that's not supposed to be there or if it's old and dead and decaying, things like that, the macrophages will walk through there and anybody know what process it is that they... Phagocytosis, good. Yeah, so oh, it's off there. Huh. There you go. Um, so anyway, but yes, phagocytosis, I think that was on your test today too. So. Uh, and they come from monocytes, so that's a different type of white blood cell. When you get into blood, you'll learn all about these different differentiations. This is sort of giving you a kind of a baseline, you know, just introduction to it all. Neutrophils wander in search of bacteria, specifically. Plasma cells synthesize antibodies, so when we look at antibodies, the immune system in general, Antibodies are these marker things, so they wander around, and every cell in your body has particular markers on the outside of it, and that's how your body recognizes what is supposed to be there and what's not supposed to be there. So everybody knows about blood typing, right? So you got A, B, O, and then A, B, and that sort of thing. So that's a really simple way of, figure, of looking at this. Your cells, if you're, who's type A? Anybody know? Type A. All right, Dr. Bohr. Anybody type B? Anybody not know their blood type? That's fine. If you don't, you don't. Okay. Um, type B, anybody O? It knows? A couple O's? Okay. So A's, you guys have like a thing like a, a pyramid on top of your blood cells, okay? It's, a, it's an expression, but the metaphor works. Okay, so you have a pyramid on top of your blood cells. The B's, think of it like a square on top of your blood cells. The O's, you got nothing. There's nothing there, okay? So your body knows that your blood type, if you're an A, I see pyramids, and I know that you're supposed to have pyramids. And if anything else comes in that's not a pyramid, then that's not supposed to be here. And so if a square shows up, well, that's wrong. we got to do something about that. So then it creates what's called antibodies, and your body has these little guys. They're not even really cells. They're just products of a cell, and they find out, and they're like, oh, they stick to the cell, and they stick to that little square thing on there. And it says, hey, right here, hey, guys, this is wrong. Somebody do something about that. So that calls your macrophages in and all these other white blood cells to come in and attack those cells. So that's why if you have a blood transfusion that doesn't match up with your blood type, then you get a big response, uh, immune response against it, and can actually kill you, frankly. Uh, so it's really important. Now the O's, you're a universal donor because you don't have anything on the outside. So the, these antibodies are wandering around, and they just bump into your cell. They're like, no, nothing there. It's really, it really doesn't exist. So you can give people O blood, the red blood cells. But O's, you can't take anybody except O, because you're not supposed to have anything. So if an A comes in, a pyramid comes in, or a square comes in, then they're like, oh, yep, something's here. Do something about this. So then you have that big immune response. So that's like the uh, that's the really down and dirty of antibodies in the immune system. There's a whole lot of other stuff that goes into it. But that's enough for tonight. Adipose cell, I'm sorry, mast cells, um, they secrete heparin. So that's heparin's uh, an anticoagulant we use. You know, that creates, our body creates it naturally, but we also <clears throat> synthesize it for people who've had uh, different, like, mm, like if you have a pulmonary embolism or a deep vein thrombosis, things like that, we can give you heparin for that. They also make histamine. So histamine does have a purpose. It does get rid of bacteria, foreign bodies, things like that. But it also, again, 
creates an immune response. So if you have a histamine response to pollen, then you get allergies. And so, you know, that's one of those kind of body overreacting sort of things. Adipocytes are fat cells, store your triglycerides. Again, they store fat. So, uh, But if you look at a, you ever get your lipids drawn, your cholesterol and stuff, it'll have triglycerides on there. So that's the amount of fat that's floating around in your bloodstream. And your adipocytes, your fat cells, try to put, some, put that somewhere instead of just letting it wander free. Because if it does, it gets in the pancreas, and then you have pancreatitis, and then that's bad. <clears throat> Collagen fibers. All right, so these are different types of fibers in connective tissue. Collagen fibers are called the white fibers because they generally look kind of whitish. They're tough, and they resist stretch, but they're flexible. So you find these things in tendons, ligaments, uh, and the deep layer of the skin, which is the dermis. We'll talk about that when we get to the skin. So why do you think in a tendon and a ligament we would be benefited from having uh, tough, not stretchy, but flexible material? Where are tendons located? What do tendons do? Let's ask that question Help first. Joints. What part of the joints? Okay, well, so there's different parts of a joint, right? There's the muscle, there's the bone, there's that sort of yeah. thing. So what is a tendon? Because it's connective tissue, right? So what's a tendon? Muscle to, bone. muscle to bone. Good. So what does a ligament do? Bone to bone. Good. So bone to bone and muscle to bone. So uh, <laughs> tendons and ligaments both. If you have your joints, so everybody's got your elbow joints, right? So you got these all these tendons that are cool. So if you have your biceps tendon that causes you to flex, you have a triceps tendon that causes you to extend. I know, Dr. Gabor, there's a lot more to it than that. We're just going simple today. <laughs> She's the physical therapist. She knows all this stuff. Um, but anyway, so each one has its own purpose, right? But you don't want it to stretch too much because if it stretches too much, then all of a sudden you got to, you know, your arm's going to be backwards and going the wrong way and super flexible. And you don't want it to, like, not be flexible at all because then you don't have any kind of give when you're moving, right? So the muscles connect, it's contracting, that tendon's kind of stretching with it, all that good stuff. So very important. Where we're at, we got oops, too far. Okay, okay. Uh, so deep layer of the skin, also dermis, because again, if you're pulling up your skin, right, it should be able to tense a little bit. Anytime you're moving your muscles, your bones, all this kind of stuff, your skin's got to be able to move with it. So it's got to be flexible. It's got to be able to move. Your reticular fibers are your thin collagen fibers, and they have this glycoprotein stuff. I think there's a picture in here. We'll get to. But, um, and they form the framework for the spleen, the lymph nodes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you want to Google later, there's a, a YouTube video on what does the spleen do from Harvard medical students, and I sing a song about the spleen. So if you ever want to know what the spleen does, you know, in your off time, there you go. Um, yeah, so they form the framework. They basically, all the stuff that holds that thing, those things in place. <clears throat> Elastic fibers, they're called yellow fibers. They're thin, they're branching, they're made of what's called elastin, and these stretch and recoil like a rubber band, okay? So these aren't good to have in your tendons and ligaments because, again, you'd have way too much stretch. Things would go way farther than they're supposed to. You wouldn't get enough resistance when you're moving things around. You'd have all this kind of floppy. Everything would be flopping around. But they're really good in place uh, like the skin. There were places where it does have to be stretchy. The lungs that have to expand and contract, right? The arteries, as, they, as you pump blood, the reason you have a pulse is because your arteries are able to expand and contract. Okay, so whenever your heart beats, it pushes blood down here, and then you can feel your pulse because your artery is going back and forth like that. Okay, so again, it's got to be able to stretch and recoil. That's very useful for if you have uh, an arterial bleed, if you have a cut in the artery, if it's severed, it has a natural recoil response that pulls it up. It makes it hard to stop bleeding if, you, if it doesn't work on its own, but it's a useful thing to then pull that vessel closed, suck it back up. It's an old movie, but anybody seen Black Hawk Down? Yeah, a couple of you, right? So that guy, the, the ranger medic that's doing the, the vein or the arterial cut down, he's trying to get a hold of it. The reason he couldn't get it is because the artery had severed and pulled back up into the muscle. So now he was trying to cut down and get it and clamp it off. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, did you do? No, I never did that as a combat medic, by the way. Yeah, um, I wasn't that cool. <laughs> okay, ground substance. So the ground substance, remember, is anything that's outside of the cells itself. Gelatinous or rubbery material. It's in between the cells, and it protects by absorbing compressive forces. So anytime you have a compression on bones, on muscles, on any part of your body, it helps cushion some of that. Uh, three classes of large molecules. You have your glycosaminic glycans. And I'm sorry, I don't know what's on your test, so I'm just covering everything. So anyway, uh, which is chondroitin sulfate. And you probably have seen that in some of the, like the osteobiflex, some of your GNC supplements, they sell chondroitin and things like that. Um, 
trying to help your joints. Mm. Jury's still out if it works or not, you know. But so if it doesn't work for you, don't spend your money on it. That's my short answer on supplements. Uh, so they're kind of unusual disaccharides. They that means disaccharide dye, meaning two saccharide sugar. So there's your chemistry again, right? So two sugars, they attract sodium and they hold water. Again, water follows salt. So the sodium gets attracted by these protein sugar molecules and it sticks on the water there because the water is following the salt. So it regulates water and the electrolyte balance because those electrolytes are crucial for muscle contraction, for nervous conduction, for your heart, all that kind of stuff. You've got to have that. That's why, you know, Gatorade has potassium and it has sodium and all that things in there. Those are called electrolytes. So all those things are necessary for that and your GAGs there uh, help control that. A proteoglycan is a bottle brush shaped molecule. When I say bottle brush, does anybody know what that means? Yeah. Okay, so I think there's, I, I know there's a picture of that one. So it's, there you go. So there's a bottle brush, okay? If you think of it, um, yeah, if you're going to clean out a bottle, right, you need a brush that's got long extensions on it, so we'll come back to that. So bottle brush shaped, and it's embedded in the plasma membranes and creates a strong bond with <laughs> other cells and other macromolecules, so it like, you see all that surface area on there? There's lots of things to stick to, okay? And so then that's able to connect stuff together and hold it. Oops. And then the adhesive glycoprotein, same kind of idea, protein carbohydrate complexes. So carbohydrates, they tend to be pretty sticky. Uh, anybody got kids in here? A couple of you? I got five of them. If you want extras, let me know. No. Um, but if you ever had a wet Cheerio on the ground and you let it dry, that's like the hardest substance known to man, right? You got to get a thing like scraper to get that thing off a screwdriver to apply it off the ground. So that's because Cheerios are primarily carbohydrates and they get super sticky when they get wet. And so then when they get wet, they get sticky and then they dry and then they adhere to that floor or whatever it is. And so now you got to use, you know, a blowtorch to cut the thing off of there. Same idea with this. There's a purpose to it. They bind plasma. They make, so they use protein and carbohydrate complexes to stick stuff together. And, uh, and they hold yeah, outside the cells and they mark the pathways for cell migration. So when cells move through the, uh, the, ma the matrix, then they help mark the road. <clears throat> so there's your bottle brush, pre uh, proteoglycan molecule. Ooh, uh, okay. Uh, loose connective tissue. So there's, yeah, loose and dense. When we talk about loose, it's got a lot of gel-like ground substance, so it's kind of squishy in there. And there's three types. There's areolar, reticular, and adipose talk about those and then there's a dense which is you know much more closely packed as if the name would imply and then the two types in there there's dense regular and dense irregular okay so areolar tissue so these are your loose connective tissue so areolar tissue uh, loose arrangement of collagenous and elastic fibers so you got both collagen and elastin so there's some stretch and there's some that resist stretch there's some that are like you know rubber bands and there's some that are not so they Kind of miss they don't all have to be just one type of connective tissue in each in each organ or each tissue there's a lot of mixing and matching <clears throat> so uh there's a loose arrangement of elastic collagenous elastic fibers there's scattered cell types and abundant ground substance so what that means is there's cells you can see the cells these are these guys over here there's lots of space in between the cells you got all these fibers that are running back and forth the different colors stain differently based on what they are if i remember right and I might be wrong on this one, but I think the pinks are the elastic and the, uh, the darker purple ones are the collagenous. Um, check me on that one. But, uh, yeah, so basically there, you know, you can see that there's lots of different fibers in there and then the cells are widely spaced between them. <clears throat> so this is underlying all your epithelia. So all those epithelial tissues that we just talked about, that's under all those. And it forms passageway for nerves and blood vessels. So uh, it kind of holds everything in place. And between the muscles, the fascia, so when you cut into a, a chicken, whatever, and you get that, like, white sheen stuff on the outside of it, that's fascia. It surrounds all your muscles, um, and it kind of keeps everything in place. Because if it wasn't there, then everything just kind of falls all over the place, right? So uh, it keeps everything tightly connected and where, it's, where it ought to be. <clears throat> reticular fibers, so these are a loose network of reticular fibers and cells, and they form the stroma or the framework for the lymphatic organs. So your lymph organs are like your spleen, again, your lymph nodes, all those things that swell up when you get sick. Um, and then the thymus, the bone. So the thymus, most of you should not have a thymus anymore. That goes away uh, by the time you're an adult. So um, if it's still there, then 
can be a problem, but uh, you wouldn't really note it unless you know you had an MRI of your neck or something. So uh, bone marrow though also has this same kind of reticular tissue. <clears throat> Adipose tissue, everybody's enemy, right? Empty looking cells within margins, and the nucleus is pressed against the cell membrane. So you see these are the nuclei right here, squished up against the cell membrane, and a big storage space in the middle there. So they're used for energy storage, insulation, space filling as cushion. They offer protection. Um, there's subcutaneous fat, so subcutaneous sub, meaning under, cutaneous, meaning skin. So fat under the skin. Anytime if you, you know, if you get a cut that's deep enough, you can see fat tissue coming out through it. Um, and then there's also brown fat that's called that's stored in hibernating animals. So your bears that are getting ready to hibernate out here, they store brown fat, and they produce heat only and no ATP. Actually, some there's a little bit of brown fat in babies too. So when they're first born, it eventually goes away as they age. But uh, they have a little bit of that. It helps with their temperature regulation as everything's kind of catching up because they're developing. <clears throat> All right, so that's your that's your irregular. So now we're getting or that's your loose connective. Now we're getting your dense connective tissue. So dense regular, it's dense, right? Squished together and it's regular. Hey, somebody got a name right. Uh, parallel coll collagen fibers. And again, we got these cells that are widely spaced apart, but these collagen fibers are all nice laid down easy, uh, very evenly. Tendons and ligaments holds the bone. Tendons are bone to muscle, ligaments are bone to bone, as you guys said. And uh, yeah, so if they get stretched too far, they get sprains and strains and things like that. And then you gotta go see Dr. Dubor. She'll help you. Uh, dense irregular. So this obviously is irregular. It's coming all over the place, right? Uh, fibers running in random directions. Everything's going all over the place. There's not a lot of open space. Everything's sort of compressed together because it's dense. Uh, it withstands the stresses applied to different directions. So instead of the dense regular is more unilateral, the dense irregular is kind of all over the place. <coughs> um, and it's usually the deeper portion of the skin and the capsules around organs. So you think your organs are like kind of sitting there and there's this stuff is also helping to hold them in place so they're not moving all over because if your liver was here and then all of a sudden it was over here and then it went up here, you know, that's probably a bad thing. I don't know. Just a thought. All right. So the cartilage supports the connective tissue with a rubbery matrix. Cartilage is the most commonly placed. You're going to see it is on the ends of the bones. So you, again, same chicken that we cut before, right? So now you got that on the top of the bone. You got that kind of rubbery, squishy stuff. That's cartilage. And chondroblasts, right? So blasts, anytime we see a blast, we know it builds things. So blast build. <clears throat> chondroblasts produce matrix. And then once they're surrounded by the matrix, then they're called a chondrocyte. So they're stuck there. They don't make it anymore as much. <clears throat> All right, so there's no blood vessels in the cartilage itself. So the diffusion has to bring everything up. So now we're like, oh, now I know why I learned about diffusion, because now I know how my cartilage gets its nutrients and removes its waste. Uh, but this is also why injured cartilage heals very slowly. We don't have a lot of blood vessels, so you can't get all the nutrients and everything else that's needed to do the healing, so then the cartilage takes a long time to heal. And the major types of cartilage depends on the fiber types. So there's hyaline fiber cartilage and elastic, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Here's your hyaline cartilage, clear glassy matrix, kind of cool looking, right? So you got your, what are these called now that they're surrounded by matrix? Oh, he just said it. Darn it. Go back to the slide. Chondro sites, right? So it's when it's still not surrounded, it's called a chondro. Everybody got a blast. blast. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so blast is building the matrix, and then once the matrix is totally surrounded, it now it's a chondro site. And there are small clusters, so they're kind of stuck together. And then they're enclosed in lacunae, which is these like spaces around it. So the chondro sites are actually these little dots in there, and lacunae are these bigger open spaces there. So this supports your airway, so if you feel on your, everybody feel on your trachea here, right, your windpipe in the front, you kind of feel as you go down, it's got some ridges and rings, those are all hyaline cartilage rings, okay, so it's supporting it and keeping it open. Your esophagus right behind that does not have that, why do you think that is? Why do we need to keep the trachea, have the trachea have the cartilage and not the esophagus? Esophagus has muscles in it to help it move. It does, that's true, but why else? So, but the esophagus doesn't have anything holding it open, so it's like kind of squished flat all the time. Why is the trachea not like that? Because you always need to breathe. Because you always need to breathe, right? And I'm not trying to trick you. This isn't hard. <laughs> all right, so you always need to breathe, right? We're doing it without thinking. So, 
always have to have that. And then plus it's pretty exposed right here, right? There's not a lot going on in front of it. So you have that to help protect it. So if you're, you know, an MMA fighter and somebody puts you in a chokehold, you got a little bit of cushion before it collapses because it stinks, right? John Bones Jones is coming up. It gets his goat bone arm in there on you. And all of a sudden you're tapped out because you don't have any of your highland cartilage and your airway squished. It's a bad day. But fortunately, we have highland cartilage that keeps that open. <clears throat> so it also eases the joint movements, and it's over the end of the bones and the movable joints, sternal ends. So your sternum is right in the middle here, and the sternal ends of the ribs. So wherever your ribs connect to your sternum, that's highland cartilage in the middle. Uh, it's a supported material in the larynx, which is your voice box, and the trachea, like we said, bronchi, fetal skeleton. So when you're still developing inside mom, uh, your, car your skeleton is initially made of this type of cartilage and eventually gets replaced by bone. Elastic cartilage is hyaline cartilage, but it's got web-like elastic fibers running through it. And it's amongst the lacunae. So remember, here's your lacunae and your chondrocytes are in the middle there because it's a site. Site means cell. So chondrocyte, chondro meaning cartilage essentially. A cartilage cell, but a chondroblast is making cartilage, right? So now it's a chondrocyte and it's stuck in this lacunae, the big space. And yeah, it's got all these fibers running through it, so it gives it more flexible, <laughs> elastic support. So that's like your ear right here, right? You can kind of flick your ear down and move it around a little bit more. It's, you can feel it's not nearly as tough as the fibers that are here in your trachea. Tracking? Tracking. Epiglottis. Who knows what the epiglottis is? Because we put up all these words, but you don't know what it is, and it doesn't help you, right? Isn't it? It's, it's in the back of your throat, like when you're breathing and swallowing, it's the... It's the flappy thing flappy that, closes, thing. that closes your trachea off when you're swallowing. Very good. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So it's, and it's made of this stuff. Elastic, right? Because it's got to flap open and closed. And when you're swallowing, you don't want food to go in the trachea because food in your lungs means choking, right? And that's bad. And then we have to do the Heimlich maneuver and nobody likes that. <coughs> or uh, what's the new word for it? Um, abdominal thrusts because Heimlich is copyrighted. Or a dead white guy. I don't know. One of the two. Uh, but anyway, so but it's got to be flappy. It's got to go across there. So every time you swallow, that closes off your trachea. So if food doesn't go down the wrong pipe, and thank goodness it's there. Fibrocartilage. Cartilage containing extensive parallel collagen fibers. It never has a perichondrium, so it doesn't have stuff on the outside of it. It resists compression and absorbs shock in some joints. So your pubic symphysis. That's the when you have your pelvic bones. The, where we go, here we go. <clears throat> you guys can see on uh, Mr. Bones here, this is the pubic synthesis right here in the middle. Okay, and so this is gonna be your fibrocartilage. Very tough, resist that compression, um, absorb shock in there. The meniscus, anybody know what the meniscus is, where it is? No, meniscus? It's on your knee, very good, yeah. So on your knee and uh, it's, you know, there's kind of different discs. It's this tough fibrocartilage discs. They're on the bottom. They're really great shock absorbers, but if you tear them, then they hurt, just like anything. And the intervertebral discs, that's your spaces in between on your spinal column. So if you see these guys right here, those are all your fibrocartilage. <clears throat> all right. Whew. Questions on that stuff? How are we doing on time? All right. About half an hour. Try to get through all the connective tissue at least tonight, and then we can pick up skin on Thursday. Bone. <clears throat> so, two different types, so spongy bone and compact bone. Spongy bone looks like a sponge. So somebody, again, got it right there. So it's delicate struts of bone. They're like kind of, you know, like spongy. They're just a little sticking out in the middle there. It's not like a solid compact piece. It's, uh, it's yeah, I don't know. Struts is kind of a weird name, but what are you going to do? Uh, so it fills the heads of your long bones. So what's an example of a long bone? Leg, leg bone, which ones? All of them, right? <laughs> the femur, very good. Okay, so any bone that's longer than it is wide. You got your flat bones, you got your long bones. So yeah, so long bone, here we got your humerus here. Okay, this is a long bone. So the head of the long bone up here, this has got your spongy bone in it up here. Okay, and then your compact bone is in the shaft of your long bones. And... Uh, yeah, so it looks more solid in appearance. Uh, it's got cells and matrix surrounding it. I think there's some pictures in here, and if not, we'll cover it in lab a little bit. Uh, it's in your lab book for sure. <clears throat> and there's cells and matrix that are surrounding the vertically oriented blood vessels. So the long bones, your blood vessels go this way, 
generally speaking. They're due, there always are entrances and exit points that go this way, but they can't tend to run this way. When you're, so your bone marrow makes your blood cells. So, and as a kid, it's more like more of your bone is taken up with marrow that actually is producing uh, blood cells, so that's your red marrow. And then as you get older, it changes to yellow marrow, which is essentially fat. And most of your blood cells are made in some of the flat bones as the primary ones. But in your long bones as a kid, you still have marrow in there. And it's making all the blood cells, so then it's got to have bone, it's got to have blood vessels to carry them out of the bone. Because uh, because it's so compact, it doesn't diffuse easily. <clears throat> all right, so here's your compact bone. So you can see, very tightly compressed. <clears throat> and you'll go over this a lot more when you get into the bones themselves, which I think is next week. But it's a calcify matrix, so calcify meaning it's made of calcium. Uh, and concentric lamellae around central haversian canals. Wow, that's a lot of big words. So it circles around a hole in the middle. All right? Like, why make this harder than it has to be? Learn the big words because you'll be tested on them probably, but, you know, it's okay to, like, think of it that way. At least that's how I do. Um, so the central canal oftentimes will have your blood vessels running through it. And you got osteocytes. In lacunae, so osteocyte, what's the site word mean? Oh. Cell, good. So osteo, what do you think that one is? Oh. Bone, bone cells, good. So osteocytes uh, in the lacunae, so that's your hole in the middle. Um, or I'm sorry, these, yeah, so these are osteocytes in the middle here, and you got lacunae around them. They're more squished, you'll see, than the cartilage ones. They're a little more open. These are more squished. So if we think of osteocytes as these ones, then what would be the things that make bone? Osteoblasts, good. Pay attention. Well done. Pipe candy out there. But just imagine I did, and then yeah, she has it. I can't give away her candy though. Anyway, uh, so bones form physical support, leverage for muscles. So you got to have something to pull against, right? That whole physics. Nobody likes physics. I shouldn't say that. People like physics a lot, but uh, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whenever you pull on a muscle, it's got to have something to pull against, or else it's not going to do anything. So that's the whole. That's one of the main reasons for bones. It stores minerals. So you need calcium not only for your bones, but for your heart, for some of these other blood vessels and nerve functions and muscle contractions, so it can store those minerals in the bones to be used later if you need them. And found in the skeleton. Blood, right? So this is the weird connective tissue because it's not like the other ones where it's a whole bunch of cells laid down that actually directly connect something. But it's a bunch of cell fragments, some with nuclei, some have a nucleus, and some of them don't. So the non-nucleated, the ones without a nucleus, pale pink cells, are the red blood cells. And the nucleated are the white blood cells. I don't know why they call them white. They're always purple on a slide. But that's how they work. Um, so Because everything looks a little gray-white if you don't actually stain it. It's not very interesting, so that's why we make the nice colors. <clears throat> but found in the heart, blood vessels, all those places that you would expect. So we have blood, and I think you'll talk about that more later, but... Uh, they start out as these kind of much bigger cells with the nucleus in them, and as they mature, eventually that nucleus goes away, and so now all they are is essentially a little floating bag of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the molecule that carries oxygen in your blood, and hemoglobin is made of iron, so if you don't have enough iron, then you get anemia and iron deficiency, and so that's why you need iron to then carry oxygen to your tissues, because if you don't have that, then you die. So, uh, but these are essentially bags of hemoglobin, and they fall around. And why do you think it's beneficial for blood cells to not have a nucleus? So some of it's storage room, right? What else? Because I can fit more hemoglobin inside there, but what else? What other reasons might there be? Mm -hmm. I sit here long enough quiet, he'll just tell me the answer. Would it be because they're a used cell, and so instead of like making identical ones they're actually used up kind of and they would get damaged from stuff they're transporting around so it's so kind of um of them or sister cells yeah so you don't they don't have to make more of themselves initially because there's already the bone marrows where they're being made so they don't need to make more out here so that's yeah uh there's a really big reason and that comes back to our tissue types and our simple strata or a simple squamous epithelium where it's one cell layer thick and kind of squished a lot of the capillaries, so when you get down to, as you trace your blood vessels, you get arteries, you get uh, arterioles, and then you get capillaries, and they get gradually smaller. So capillaries are super small little tubes that are usually only big enough for one blood cell to fit through at a time because you don't want a whole bunch of them going through there, right? If you're trying to get rid of all the stuff that's inside of here, all your oxygen, you don't want a whole bunch of other ones. All these guys 
if you know that if the blood vessel is this thick, then only these two can drop off their oxygen, right? So now these ones in the middle can't. So you want one that's only one blood vessel thick. And then if you make it so there's no nucleus in the middle, no big stuff, no Golgi apparatus, no ribosomes or anything else, all you got is a bag of hemoglobin. Now that thing can squish down really thin. And so that by squishing it, it increases the surface area that you're going through that thing. So then more of that oxygen can diffuse out. So pretty cool, right? Yeah. Like, oh man, like there's a purpose for all of it. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, nerve tissues. That's it. That's another one. So large neurons. Uh, a neuron is a nerve is like a single cell in a nerve, but a nerve itself is multiple neurons put together. So they're large neurons, long cell processes. So they got all these arms that are sticking out all over the place, and they got a much smaller glial cells, which are all these guys around here. <clears throat> and these don't have any dendrites or axons. So dendrites, den dendra is from the Latin for tree. I forget exactly what it is, but. Um, it's so it's because it looks kind of like a tree, right? Sticking out here. So these are called dendrites. And then your axon is this guy that goes all the way down here. And they make connections between each other. So there can be an axon coming here that's connecting to this dendrite. Another one is connecting to here. And so then it sends its signals down. And it transmits it all the way down the line. And so that's internal communication between the cells, down to the brain, the spinal cord, nerves, ganglia. Ganglia are just like big clumps of on here. So uh, you see here your spinal cord. As it's coming out here, it's tough to see, but if you can kind of see these uh, bulges in the nerves that are coming out here, those are called ganglia, so it's like a big kind of a bulge in the nerve itself. <clears throat> um, all right. Muscle tissue. Those are cool, right? Muscles are important. People spend a lot of money trying to get bigger muscles, and then they get old and they all get flabby anyway, and here we all are, right? So, sorry, that's a little defeatist, yeah? Um, exercise is good for you. The function is to exert physical force on the other tissue so you can move your hand, move your legs, move your arms, move all these other things. Also push blood through a vessel like we talked about. The arteries have their muscles in the walls that then squish it down. Uh, Otto mentioned having the uh, muscles in the, um, in the esophagus that help push food along and the same things happen in the whole throughout the digestive tract. They're also an important source of body heat so they help, <clears throat> they help regulate your body temperature. You have three types. You have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, and we'll talk about those. So skeletal muscle is also called striated muscle because you can see it has these striations or these lines in here. They're long. They're cylindrical, cylindrical, long cylinders. They don't have branches in them. They're just a straight shot, and they have these striations that go through, and then a lot of peripheral nuclei. So the nuclei are sticking kind of out here. So this is all your movements, your facial expressions, posture, Breathing, speech, all this kind of stuff has striated muscle. Um, excretion, yeah, because you've got to be able to control that. So otherwise, we'd have a messy classroom, right? Skeletal muscle, yeah. <clears throat> all right, cardiac muscle is only found in the heart, and it's really cool because it, it's branched. It has striations like, uh, like the skeletal muscle does. See that? But these are straight, and these are branched, okay? <clears throat> And it has intercalated discs. Those are these things here. And it has a central, one central nuclei per cell instead of a whole bunch of like outside nuclei. So these ones, the nucleus is in the middle. These ones, the nucleus is on the outside. So you have one centralized nuclei per cell, and it's used for the pumping of blood. The cool thing about these guys, and you'll get more into it in the heart, is they have their own uh, contractile. Like you don't, not only do you not think about them but they have an automaticity, so they fire regularly. So that's why your heart is beating, you know, at the, at the resting heart rate, whatever your heart rate is right now. It's doing its thing. And then as you increase your activity levels, then it automatically speeds it up. You go to sleep, it's going to slow itself down. So it's automatic, automaticity. <clears throat> Smooth muscle, this is in your GI tract, so all throughout your esophagus, your small intestine, large intestines, all that stuff. Um, and then the uterine walls as well. Uh, this does not have any striations in it, you see. It also has one centralized nucleus instead of lots of peripheral ones like the striated does. But this has, you have no voluntary control over these. So it just happens all the time. Um, yeah. Hair erection, so when you get the, uh, when you get goosebumps, that's what it's talking about there. Control of your pupils, you're not thinking about that when it's closing and opening based on how much light's coming in or what kind of drugs you're doing. Uh, I mean, this is what it is, right? So, but sheets of muscle, so instead of like having, uh, you know, clumps of maybe ropey muscles or whatever you think of when you think of skeletal muscle, you've got sheets of muscle that surround the whole organ. 
<clears throat> and yeah, so this array of talking about that. Yep, yep, yep. Sphincters. So you have sphincters that are both have voluntary and inv involuntary control. So you don't necessarily have to think about not going to the bathroom while you're sitting here. But then when you really got to go, you got that voluntary control to hold it in because you're like, dang, Mr. Irving, Dr. Irving, you got 20 minutes because I'm going to get out of here. All right. <clears throat> Intercellular junction. So this is the stuff in between your cells that uh, allow for connections and all that kind of stuff. So you got different types. And then every cell except blood have some sort of anchoring to each other or to the matrix surrounding them. So even if you have those types, like the connective tissue where there's one cell here and one over here, they're anchored to the matrix itself. And that's by intercellular junctions. <coughs> so inter is between cells, intra is within the cell. So intercellular, between cells. All right, so you got different types here and we'll go through some of those. There's your gap junction, your desmosomes, and your tight junctions. So your tight junctions, these completely encircle the cell. All right, so you can see it's almost like a zipper. Here. Um, and they have complementary, so grooves and patterns, so everything kind of fits together really nicely. And it prevents substances and bacteria from passing between them. So in the GI and the urinary tract, why do you think these are beneficial in those type of areas? Because you have so many outside things that go through a process, it's probably the most vulnerable. Right, so you don't want all that stuff that's out here, you don't want just a mad rush of all that coming through. You want your body to be able to regulate what it picks up and what it doesn't. So it keeps these really tight junctions around there. So if you think of, uh, I mean, even your large intestine, right? So we get to finally made your, your dinner from last night is making all the way through and now it's become fecal matter. Gross, why are you talking about poop? Okay, anyway, because it's part of life. Everything comes down to poop. Just remember that. So there's a song about that too. Uh, anyway, so anyway, you got fecal material floating around in here. You don't want that coming through here, right? So tight zipper-like junctions, let's keep all that where it's supposed to be so it goes where it needs to go. Because poop in the abdominal cavity is a bad day for everybody. And a trip to the general surgeon up here, Dr. Avenue, and or Dr. Larson. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, did you do, yeah, so GI urinary tract, same thing. You don't want urine going backwards where it ought not to be because that's waste product. Desmosomes is a patch between the two cells, and uh, it holds them together and resists mechanical stress, so any kind of stretching or pulling on them. Um, it's got microfilaments that kind of, you can sort of see it down here, those little guys that stick together that hold them there, and they terminate on a thick protein plaque. So this is all made of protein here. you got these microfilaments that are sticking everything together right there. And, uh, yeah, and then the cytoplasmic filament, so then there's filaments on this side, so it's hard to see with the lighting as it is, but there's filaments inside here that are attaching to that plaque and kind of keeping everything together. So this is seen in the uterus, the heart, epidermis, again, places where it needs to stretch more. <clears throat> Cap junctions are communicating junctions, and that's a ring of so six transmembrane proteins. So a water-filled channel. So this allows, you know, uh, direct stuff to transmit back and forth between them. So you have these spaces that go here so anything that's small enough to fit will just go directly between them uh, so small solutes that's like your salt your potassium things like that can just go straight through your big stuff remember your your uh, rowdy drunk sugar isn't going to necessarily be able to push himself through there and if he does then we got more problems <clears throat> all right so now okay pause any questions on that stuff again i know we're covering a lot tonight and you guys just had a test and you're like when is this going to be over that's okay. We're getting there. We're making it. Uh, the more we do today, the less we'll have to do on Thursday, and then the more time we'll have for lab. So, all right. So the glands, lots of different types of glands. They excrete substances for elimination and use elsewhere in the body. And they're mostly epithelial tissues, and so we'll hopefully remember some of these words that we were just talking about. So you got your exocrine glands, which means it connect, maintain a connection to a duct, like an epithelial tube. And then your endocrine glands have no ducts, but they go straight into the bloodstream. So exocrine, exo, out. Endocrine, endo, goes in. All right? So this is like your hormones and things like that that just go straight into the bloodstream and get transported somewhere else to be used or, or discarded. Mixed organs have both exocrine and endocrine. So there's your liver, your gonads, pancreas. Um, uh, so like your liver, well, pancreas, yeah, all these things. They make... Both hormones and they make other kinds of things. So depending on what the need is and where the what the particular substance is, they uh, use those different different types of glands. 
So an exocrine gland, this member we see the tubules here, so stuff's going into the tubules. So it has a stroma, which is the capsule, and the extensions of the capsule, that, and a sep called septa, which divide the gland in a lobe. So this is your whole gland, and then the stroma, or septa here, divide the gland into sections. And then the parenchyma is everything that's, you know, that creates the secretion. So that's these guys up here. <clears throat> and, yep, see the side, okay. And the acinus is a cluster of simple cuboidal cells surrounding the duct, draining those cells. So there you go. There's all your simple cuboidals. Uh, I know they're not terribly square-shaped, but, again, when you've got a gland and they're all kind of facing in, so you've got to think of them as being in that three-dimensional thing. So then they're going to be more cube-shaped when you look at them like that. <clears throat> All right, so these are types of exocrine glands. You got your sweat glands, you got your mammary glands, and you got your uh, pancreas glands. So your secretory portion is here, and then your gland is this beige stuff up here. So sec secretory is purple, and the beige one is the is the gland portion. So simple glands like your sweat gland uh, doesn't have any branches coming off of it; it's just one straight tube. Whereas compound glands have multiple branches coming off, and the shape of the gland kind of determines what type it is. So um, yeah, so if it forms a, a sort of a sac like this, then it's an acinar, and it's a, or, yeah, yeah, so more of a sac, and then the tubular acinar is like a sac that goes into a tube like that. And see the gland, you'll notice the difference here, they both look similar, but this is all the secretory stuff that's still just in the sac itself, and then the tubule goes up here, whereas this, it's still secretory all the way up into this tubule here. So that's the difference between an an acinar and a tubule acinar. <clears throat> Those are big words. I don't use them in my daily practice, just so you know. If you're like, the PA really need to know acinar and tubule acinar? No. But hey, you do for this class, so learn it. <clears throat> uh, and then when you're, you know, after you're done, then you can dump it. But types of met methods of secretion. So you got your serous glands, you got mucous glands. So the serous is like a thin, watery. Uh, if you think of it like... Okay, so here we'll go. Everybody remember back to high school, and everybody had zits, or most of us did anyway. <coughs> so if you ever had a zit that popped, you get all the yucky white stuff come out, and at the end of it, it's this thin, watery, kind of yellowish stuff. That's the serous secretion from that. So you had the, um, the pus, the exudate that came out, and then the last stuff is that serous stuff. So that's that thin, watery secretion. And so that can be your sweat, your milk. Tears, digestive juices, so anything that's watery is more of that serous gland. <clears throat> mucus glands are the glycoprotein, so those proteins and the mucin that absorb water and they form that sticky secretion, so it's thicker, just like mucus. Um, and then some of them, mixed glands, have both serous and mucus. And so then the cytogenic glands are the last types, and that's the ones that actually produce a cell, so cyto, cell, genic, creating, genesis, making, so cytogenic or beginning. Uh, so sperm and egg cells, those are releasing a whole cell. <coughs> Variations, yeah, okay. So a holocrine gland, that's the, next, that's the next kind. So secretory cells disintegrate. So instead of actually producing something and then using those Golgi apparatus or whatever to push it out to the outside, now the, the cell itself disintegrates and the contents just spill out. Um, and so this is the oil-producing glands of the scalp and the eye. And we've got the scalp for an example. So that oily stuff you get in your hair, if you don't wash it for a few days, that's what's going on there. All right. Uh, American glands release their product by exocytosis. So American exocrine, exocrine, their exocytosis, they, as you can see, here's your little um, vacuole, and, or vesicle vacuoles, and pushes it all onto the outside. Exocytosis, right? <coughs> and then apocrine. Yeah, so they made a distinction between apocrine and americrine. They're really American glands where they're, you know, doing their thing, but they have an, you know, an apical cytoplasm. And yeah, anyway, it's just an old name. So, memory and armpit, armpit sweat. Congratulations. Sweat, uh, apocrine secretion. So, yay. All right, mucous membranes. Like we talked about, here's your memory member. Oh, no, okay, pseudostratified epithelium and pseudostratified, so they all reach the basement membrane here. Even that one comes down there. There's only one cell layer thick, but it looks like there's more, so it's pseudostratified. Uh, and then it has these, you know, these goblet cells that are making the mucus here, and they're pushing that out. And then that's got your 
uh, yeah, epithelium, your lamina, all these different parts of it. So and then your basement membrane is down here, and this has all your connective tissue in it. So you got your epithelial tissue up here, your connective tissue down here, and that looks like areolar tissue. So you got all your blood vessels running through it. And then this is lining the passageway again that opens the exterior, so uh, your lungs, that sort of thing. And then the mucus coating helps move everything out like we were talking about and gets it all out where it ought not. All right, cutaneous. So that's your, yeah, so the external body symptom. Okay. Um, yeah, so the whole external body surface is made up of cutaneous membrane, which is that stratified squamous keratinized epithelium that we talked about. It's all different layers. Um, and then, yeah, so then you have your synovial membranes, and that lines your joints. Your serous membranes lines the interior membrane. So serous, remember that serous fluid that we made is that thin, watery stuff. So anything that's lining the inside of an organ or a cavity uh, is going to have that kind of a, a, a lubrication on it going to help everything move the way it's supposed to. All right. And we've talked about all those different types. So you got your, yeah, endothelium lines the blood vessels in the heart. And then the mesothelium, mesomiddle, lines the pleural pericardial. So the pleural is around the lungs. The pericardial is around the heart. And the peritoneal, um, oh, it's blanking on that one. I might blame on that one. I know that word. Come back to it. It's going to bother me tonight. All right. Hyperplasia of tissue cell growth through cell multiplication. So we're getting uh, the cells are multiplying. They're making more of themselves. That's hyperplasia. Hypertrophy is an enlargement of pre existing cells. So your muscles, they, you don't get more cells when you exercise. Your cells just grow larger. Um, and then neoplasia is growth of a tumor. So when we look at neo as new, but neoplasia, usually we talk about that as being a bad thing. So we say neoplasm is a benign or malignant tumor, and then it's uh, through growth of abnormal tissue. So benign and malignant, you know, we can discuss that sort of thing, but benign essentially means that it doesn't spread to other parts. It stays in one area. It doesn't mean it's not dangerous. It just means that it's going to stay in that one spot. So you can have brain tumors that are benign, but eventually, if they keep getting big enough, they're going to cause problems and can still lead to death and everything else. So even though they don't get, you know, uh, malignancies, you don't spread to other organs, they still take up a lot of space and uh, cause seizures and eventually death. So you still have to do something about them. So just because somebody says it's benign, it really depends on where it is. Now, if it's a benign fat tumor called a lipoma, just in the skin, we don't do anything about it, just there. It really depends on just because somebody says, I have a tumor, doesn't mean they're going to die. You know, benign could be bad, could be not so bad. Malignant, that's all bad. Just don't get one of those. All right. Atrophy. That cell shrinkage from loss. So exercising a whole lot, you get hypertrophy, right? And then atrophy is when it shrinks from not working out, as an example. So senile atrophy, we all lose muscle mass as we age. And then disuse atrophy from lack of use. So got a leg in a cast, then you're not using that one anymore. And take the leg out of the cast, and it's a very different size than the one that was uncasted. <clears throat> Necrosis, pathological death of tissue, and gangrene is from insufficient blood supply. Gas gangrene is to an anabiotic, anaerobic bacterial infection. So an, meaning not, aerobic oxygen. So no oxygen means the bacteria live in an area where they don't get oxygen. If they had oxygen, they would die, but they live, they thrive on no oxygen environments, and they produce gases that then cause tissue death, and that's how you get gas gangrene. <clears throat> infarction is a sudden death. So when you have a myocardial infarction, that means death of the tissue in the heart. Uh, and that's from lack of blood. Usually, you know, eventually it starts out as a, what's called an ischemia, which means a lack of oxygen. It turns into an infarction, which means death. So if somebody's having a heart attack, they'll usually start out with an ischemia, and the tissues won't get enough oxygen because there's a clot or whatever reason. And then eventually that leads to tissue death, and that's infarction. A decubitus ulcer is a bed sore or pressure sore. Laying on one side too long, if you're in a, a nursing home or hospital, you have to be turned really frequently. Otherwise, you get big ulcers on the side because that pressure on the one side without being moved tends to cause the skin to erode, and you get ulcers there. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death. So all your cells, you say all, never say all, right? Never say never and never say always. Um, but there, the majority of your cells have a pre-programmed lifespan. So like your blood vessels, your blood cells, they live about 30 days and they're useful. And then after that, 
they go through apoptosis and they dissolve and they get sucked up and then the parts are kind of recycled and made into new blood cells or go to different places. Some get wasted out. Um, but they shrink and they're phagocytized. They're, you know, yeah. And then, you know, it talks about this. So the uterus after delivery. So while mom's carrying baby, uterus gets much larger. Baby's delivered. Uterus eventually shrinks down to its old size. That's apoptosis. Um, the cells no longer are needed. So. All right, tissue repair. Damaged tissues are repaired in two different ways. So there's regeneration, there's fibrosis. So this is when you have some sort of a injury to the tissue. Regeneration means the tissues are replaced uh, with original cells and then it restores normal function. So this is like your skin injuries and liver, they both regenerate. Your fibrosis is a replacement of damaged cells with scar tissue. So if you end up with scars, um, that means collagen comes in there instead of the original tissue, something else gets in there. So it can help to hold the organ together, but the function is not restored because anytime you're replacing that original tissue with something else, and it's not working the way it should. So healing of muscle injuries, a lot of time you end up with scar tissue on that. Uh, scarring of the lung tissue, like in tuberculosis, uh, people would get you know pretty bad scarring. The, the lungs wouldn't work anymore. They replace those nice alveoli with scar tissue, and you don't have that much function anymore. And then severe cuts and burns, if it's a big enough cut, if it's a large enough area, or certain... Uh, certain people are just more prone to it. So keloids are excessive scarring. So there's some people that are more likely to just scar when they're injured and they get a lot of extra scar tissue. Uh, and that's raised shiny scars. <clears throat> so when we have a laceration or a cut, this is generally the steps that it goes through. So the damaged blood vessels here are broken. They start leaking. And anytime there's a leak where blood comes in contact with the outside of the uh, the blood vessel instead of just the inside, and that triggers a response to where you have um, to where you have histamine coming out. So that causes the blood vessel to dilate to get more blood cells in there, but it also uh, can start forming a clot. And then plasma seeps into the wound and carrying antibodies and clotting factors, white blood cells, all that stuff. <clears throat> so the clot forms. So this is where the blood you know it's no longer actively bleeding, and the scab forms on top of the surface. And everybody likes to pick their own scabs, right? Ew, gross. Macrophages start eating up and cleaning all this kind of stuff in here. So your macrophages, remember, they come in macro, big, phage, eat. So they're big cells that eat stuff. And they start coming in, and they start eating away all the stuff that you don't need in here, all that debris and everything, that clot. It's no longer useful. So they, because otherwise, if you just started closing this up, and this doesn't go away, and you're just going to push out, and you got all this, like, gross stuff coming out, right? So, hey, thanks, macrophages. Good job. <clears throat> All right, so as they're eating all that stuff now, new blood cells, new blood vessels try to start coming in, and the tissue is replaced with what it was supposed to be before, so brown substance or uh, whatever it was. Um, and then, yeah, so the fibroblasts, remember fibroblasts, blasts mean to build things. So the fibers, fibroblasts are being laid down, and then you get new collagen uh, to get the old stuff out, and then the fibroblastic phase is three to four days, lasts up to two weeks, depending on the size of the injury. You still got the scab over there, and that scab is protecting all that stuff that's going on underneath. So it's helping make sure that it doesn't um, become a problem. You know, if that scab's pulled off and you reopen the wound there, it starts bleeding again, it's got to kind of start all over again. <clears throat> and then the surface, that's the last thing, is the surface epithelial cells start to regenerate up here. And eventually, once this those cells push everything up, then that scab falls off. And the epithelium grows thicker and gets the nice keratinized layer that we talked about up there. And then the connective tissue only like forms a scar if it's, you know, depending on your tissue type genetics, all that sort of thing, determines usually how big of your scars you get. Um, and then the remodeling phase can last up to two years. So just because you have a scar initially, it may deteriorate or it may lessen over time. Uh, usually you'll have something left, but it's usually not quite as red or angry or you know, bad looking. So after surgery, sometimes people have, you know, bigger scars that are much more red and angry looking. And then over the course of time, they'll kind of go back and just sort of be shinier skin and you can still see them, but they're not nearly as noticeable as they were. All right. I just finished five minutes early. So we'll cover this on Thursday. And yeah, questions, thoughts, <laughs> anything? Yes. Uh, I was thinking just kind of uh, maybe even draw like a little flow chart just to kind of synthesize all this, you know, what is the 
epithelium versus the cartilaginous okay. or the uh, connective we'll tissue. Just okay. Real quick before we go. Sure. We've been drawing it on the whiteboard. I yeah, I was just going to try to get this yeah. to go up. Put that up. I know, I'm sorry, you guys. This one here. Oh, that one. There we go. Turn this off. Okay. Because we just learned a lot of different things, and yeah. I want you to know the classification. A lot of, of big words, right? Okay, so we'll go, we'll go simple. Uh, so let's let's take a blood vessel, okay? I was even thinking. I was thinking like a like a flow chart. Like oh, I see. Okay. Nervous muscle connective epithelium, and then what? Mostly uh, under the epithelium connective. Okay. Just so that like it's like separated in their minds. Okay. So let's start. Just with our last couple of minutes. All right. I'm just going to abbreviate so we save time, all right? So here's your epithelial tissues, okay? So who remembers the different types of epithelial tissues? So we have major types are two different groups of them. Uh, Multi-cell and single cell, which I forget. Stratified okay. and simple, right? So you have simple and stratified. Try to write somewhat That's, legibly. Yeah, keep it just like keep it. Okay, simple. and so then within those things, and there's also the cell shapes. Who remembers the cell shapes of them? Squamous. Squamous. What's that one? Squished, right? Squamous, squished. Okay. Cuboidal. Good. Good. And columnar. Good. And so, and then also with this one, what was the third one of this one? Simple stratified and pseudo stratified, right? Pseudo meaning fake false. or false, stratified. Okay, good. So you have your types, and then within those types are your shapes, right? So you can have and squamous, simple squamous, stratified squamous, and then columnar, simple or stratified or pseudostratified. I don't believe there's any such thing as pseudostratified squamous or cuboidal. I think pseudostratified only applies to columnar. If you find something else in your reading, then go with that. But okay, uh, what else did we cover tonight? Oh, I gotta remember. Connective tissue. Uh, so we have the connective tissue next. Okay, so you got your connective tissue. Remember what type? So let's start with. Um, okay, so two broad categories of connective tissue. Remember how they look, right? Yeah. There was regular and irregular. Okay. <clears throat> Regular and irregular. Okay, and so then within those two types, what's the other ones that we have? Remember, so there's dense regular, there's loose, and there's dense. Okay, so there's yeah. I guess it's all. It's kind of hard to make a flow chart out of these ones because it's sort of overlapping. Yeah. But um, so there's loose. Dense. Okay, so it can be dense regular and dense irregular, and it can be, well, loose is usually its own thing, but um, yeah, so dense can be regular, irregular, and then loose. Uh, okay, so of the loose types, there's areolar, there's particular, and another one. A-D-I-P-O-S-E. Adipose. That's your fat. Okay, and then your dense as the regular and irregular. Yeah, that should actually probably be that. Irregular. <laughs> okay, so your dense has regular and irregular. And then with the regular, I believe there's the, if I remember rightly, the packs of cartilage. Okay. But then it's kind of all. Like real broad there. Yeah. Just because I feel like everything is like oh, it's kind of all over the place. Over yeah. Because we kind of we just kind of yeah. Threw so it, just threw a shot kind of like right. what fits in what categories. Okay. There's so also. cartilage. Oh, it's sort of a mishmash. So with it, and then when you look at connective tissue, when we get to like cartilage. 
I need to spell it right. A G E, right? Yeah. Very good. That's all. So cartilage can contain some loose and some dense. It sort of all kind of flows in there. It just depends on what type it is. But your cart cartilage type, so there's your hyaline, right? Who else has another one they remember? Elastic. Elastic. Good. And fibrocartilage, yep. right? Yep. Those. Yep. <clears throat> Perfect. Okay. okay. And there are two other connective tissue types. And then we have your blood, right? Yep. And then your bone. I think we had nervous in there too, didn't we? As a connective so that's tissue. That's a different. Nope. That's its own. That's its own. Oh, that's type. its own thing. All right. Yep. All right. Well, it's so. Draw a circle around or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So of the connective tissues, you have your cartilage, you have your blood, it comes over here. Good. Then you also and you loose and dense. And what's that? And bone. bone. I'm sorry, what? Bone. Bone, bone. is yeah. also okay. connective Good. tissue. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yep. Now we're over there too. Yes. The other ones are way more simple than that. Yeah. <laughs> connective so tissue is connective like crazy. Tissue is sort of a crazy one that's all over the place <laughs> and it uses like all these things sort of kind of flow into that stuff and then yeah. And then, so you have down here, now you have your nervous tissue, right? Yep. Let me use a different color. Maybe that one. Your nerves. And a nerve cell is called a what? An individual nerve cell? A neuron. Good. Okay. And then you have your muscle. Okay, and so we have three different types. Skeletal. Skeletal, good. It's also called what? Okay. Cardiac. And so that's one. Smooth. Pretty. Good. And that's it. That's it. Okay, and then your junctions, right? We don't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was just, yeah. just keeps going. So your junction types. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to do this. Do I, just, I was just thinking, like, just so you guys could, because in my brain, the way my brain works is, like, I'm very much, like, category. What things go in what category? So I just wanted to maybe just real quick run through before the evening was over, just, like, category one. Because you will need to know these four tissue categories for your test. You will need, need to be able to tell me what they are list them for me. So epithelium is one. Connective tissue is two. Nerve is three and muscle is four. So just kind of trying to like, so you're not just like thinking that epithelial tissue is a connective tissue, just kind of just wanted to go over it. Sorry to make you stay late and go through that. Thanks for doing that. Sure, yeah. Um, Dave. <clears throat> Thank you everyone. Today was a long, rough day. You guys yeah. all did awesome. Thanks for your patience. Thank you so much, Dave, for, for being here. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, you want to stay behind, I'll be here yeah. and welcome. That's all right. That's all right. I try to, I try to like do one thing and then just like. That's good. Like that. <laughs> Take more candy.